Hello and welcome to one of our latest MinTech product editions here, the Knowledge Podcast. I'm Marcel Goldenberg, the Head of Pricing at MinTech. In this new podcast series, we will aim to release a fresh podcast every couple of weeks, covering some of the most exciting areas in the food markets. This week we will cover the nut and raisin markets. Next week we're looking at pea proteins and plant proteins in general. And then we're aiming to speak about vanilla in the mid to end of February um, with a chat that goes to Madagascar quite frequently. However, I'm not sure it'd be a true podcast if it was just to be myself here on this podcast. So of course I've got some guests with me. So I'm, I'm super excited to have um, Edward Dannon, Director of Voice Val and Victoria Friedman, Product Manager at Voice Val, here with me. Um, why don't we start it off by you just giving us a quick explanation about VoiceWell, what it is you do typically, and then we can maybe move into the podcast. Um, I think it's always best if you explain the company yourself and me trying to, to do that. Sure. Hi, it's Edward here. Um, just a brief history on VoiceWell so you can set the scene of what type of company we are. We are um, founded in 1981, importers of dried fruits, nuts, seeds and coffee from all around the world. We, we import and distribute those products via our offices in London, France, Germany, Turkey, uh, China, and Bolivia now. Um, and we import products pretty much from around the world, but also have investments in some of those countries. And I know we'll focus a bit more on Brazil nuts, where we have our own factory there, but we also have a facility for hazelnuts in Georgia as well. And you're quite famous for pine nuts, right? I think we were talking just before about uh, some of the some of the specifications where you became quite uh, infamous in the market. Well, Voicefell have had a presence in China since, uh, well, actually since 1996, uh, where we started an office there which assisted our exporting. So, yeah, and that office was set up predominantly to assist exports of pine nuts, pumpkin seeds, sunflower seeds, goji berries, and at the time when China was exporting walnuts, walnuts as well. Actually, since 2008, Voice World China has been an importing office, so we've actually seen huge growth in the Chinese market as a Voice World group, as a, as a consumer of the products which we import. Okay, fantastic. Um, Vittorio, good to have you here as well. So you largely look at, um, not the Brazil nuts, you are the man for hazelnuts, for example, is that right? Yes, that, that's right. Uh, we, are, we supply the major confectionery manufacturers in the continent, as well as we, uh, we cover uh, a, good, uh, a good part of the market in the UK with the retailers, packers, cereal manufacturers. Um, thank you both. Very good to, to have you here with us at the podcast. Um, and thank you, obviously, for being almost the guinea pigs here. Obviously, I think uh, the technology this time around, you know, we'll be evolving it over time. Um, but I'm sure we're going to come back towards uh, the mid or end of the year. Now, Edward, you look largely at uh, the Brazil nut market. And, you know, our prices on the Brazil nut markets for Mintech currently have shown a 13% drop since, uh, since a year ago. We're at about $2.90 per pound at the moment which however is down significantly to two years ago when it was um, more than double of the price. What has really happened? Can you tell us a little bit more about, you know, maybe the last one and a half years, but also what is going to happen maybe in 2020, according to expectations? Yeah, um, sure. Looking at a pricing chart of Brazil nuts, if you go back past 2017, actually, it's a real wobbly ride. Um, and I think that everything which is happening now actually stems back to 2017. So just quickly to recap, in 2017, about 50% drop in production from Bolivia caused a massive undersupply, um, with pricing moving more than three or four times up. Um, and that price increase happened, one, because of the, the small amount of Brazil that's available, but two, due to a big craze in in South Korea for the consumption of Brazil nuts. So while supply was short, demand um, still needed to cover from traditional markets as there was no time for recipe changes or, or changes on the shelves. But there was also a boom in demand in South Korea, so pricing really rocketed. What kicked it off in South Korea for them to suddenly buy all that many Brazil nuts? Yeah, South Korea as a market in general can sometimes go with fashions um, and fashions in that origin are generally driven actually by uh, television shopping channels. So we visited China, visited South Korea during this booming period and witnessed the 20 plus shopping channels on television where they promote certain items and they move massive volumes through these shopping channels. 
Um, what happened with Brazil's is that it moved in massive volumes in the shopping channels, but also made it into traditional retails. So whilst the shopping channels eventually would die out, the volume in, in South Korea was going to stay in some way from being 70 tons pre-2017 mm. to moving to 9,000 tons over after 2017. We knew it would fall back, but weren't sure how much it would fall back. Um, and so after that happened in South Korea, so we're now, we've gone through 2017 boom, 2018, which is what you mentioned, so two years ago, the pricing was more than three times what it was. 2018 was seeing the South Korean demand maintain, whereas traditional retailers had adjusted their traditional markets, let's say in Europe, had adjusted recipes or delisted. So through 2018, they're feeling the effect of the high prices from 2017. So recipe will change and demand was greatly diminished throughout the whole of 2018. So whilst 2018 started with a high price, throughout that year, we basically saw a falling price. That coupled with a very good crop um, in Bolivia, Peru and Brazil, the major exporting countries, saw uh, pricing basically fall through the year, throughout 2018. Then 2019, when you mentioned it was still 13% higher than now, we hadn't seen any further decrease, let's say. Um, supply stabilised, uh, the new crop was coming in from, from Bolivia, and we saw actually for 2019 quite a poor looking crop after a bumper 2018 crop. The 2019 crop didn't feel as, as plentiful, which was actually proven through the year. If you look at the exports, there was a big reduction in 2019. But in South Korean demand, has that stayed as high as it was in 2017? Or was that really just a one spike year and then it just dropped back down as the TV AdWords went down? Or It was it was maybe a one and a half to two year spike, okay. let's say. Yeah. Um, but it's dropped pretty right, much. Right, so that's back to the levels pre-2017. No, it? because pre-2017 they did three containers. Okay, so okay. It was so really it's... nothing. It was a, <laughs> not so now they've gone into an cons average consuming country, quite a good consuming country still. Okay. However, all of their imports are now coming from Peru and not from Peru and from Bolivia mm. because of duty preferences. It's much, much more economical to be buying, by, I think about 25% cheaper to be buying from Peru than it would be buying from Bolivia. So in 2019, there was less than a container shipped of Brazil nuts from right. Bolivia to South Korea, but of the 4,000 odd tons from Peru, um, I'd say the majority is still going to South Korea. Now let's look at 2020, because the traditional markets for the Brazil nuts uh, remain the US and Europe. Um, what's their anticipation for 2020? Are they going to potentially increase their demand again? As I mentioned earlier, $2.90 per pound for um, for the Brazil at the moment, do you anticipate this to pick up again? Yeah, so let, let's understand why in 2020 we're at this price point because this is a, a big low price in terms of Brazil nuts if you look for the last 10 years. Um, so we're here pretty much because of lack of demand. Uh, Brazil nuts is a small market of 30 odd thousand tons, it's about two weeks worth of almond shipment, so it's a very small, small commodity. And Whilst it has an effect, the amount of supply available, the larger effect is demand. And we've seen over the last year, since, since 2017 really, a fall in demand. So pricing has now appeared at the very low end. And at this end, it becomes very challenging for it to be um, a stable market at source. So at source, the way the collections work is in November, December time, collectors are pre-financed to go into the forest and start to collect Brazil nuts. And they get this pre-financing based on an agreed-ish raw material price. So there is a price which is set. Mm. By the time it arrives to factories, that price is generally higher, so it then gets renegotiated again, and it's the factories who take that, have to, re have to pay more, basically. Um, so it's, that's why I say loosely agreed. But this year, Factories have become, or the people financing the collection, which is predominantly factories, have become much more aware of the global dynamics of the market and how Brazil nuts, whilst it's at a low, they fear a falling price further. So what happened was they became a stalemate between the people willing to advance money and, and 
the people who wanted the money but didn't want to agree to the price, which mm. the people who would advance the money at. So it, the collection became a bit stunted. So that whilst collection is happening from areas surrounding the, the factories, so you are there is a flow of raw material. The bigger collection, which happens wider and deeper in the forest, has been a bit stunted and isn't happening as quickly. And the reason is the factories don't want to give the money, but also the factories can't get money because for the last three years they've had a challenging period, and lenders are less willing to lend given the past history of the last three years. So we're at a very low point in the market, but it's a challenging start, let's say. Um, so what are some of the alternatives for the collectors at these prices? Is there are other nuts, other areas of employment for them, and what would that even mean for you know the, the Brazil nut industry? The Brazil nut collection is vital for the survival of the Amazon rainforest in Bolivia. That's a cut to the chase. Um, it's a way of getting a sustainable income into a region of forest, which otherwise may not be forest. Um, it supports over 40,000 people, whether that be people living in the forest or people who migrate into the forest um, for the collection. So not having Brazil nuts being collected isn't a goal of anyone. We, it has to be the goal of companies and corporations to ensure that the price is sustainable, that people will go in and collect it, um, and it's, it will sustain the forest by doing so. We repeat this point many times. But I was going to say, um, I mean, do you do a fair amount? Because you just said companies need to pay their part as well in this kind of equation. So are you doing anything here to kind of um, foster the saving the rainforest? The biggest thing that anyone can do is, yes, we are, we are doing things. So we are investing in the forest and infrastructure. We've been donating radios to communities who are, who are cut off. But really, forgetting all the projects, the biggest things we can do is continuing to support the purchasing of a commercial product from this region, which is Brazil nuts. Um, we've invested in our own factory, so we have 400 people who in employment, where we keep them in, in employment throughout the year where possible. Like, um, even throughout the challenging periods, we ran slow the production to make sure that the production... Is it industry lasts. standard then that usually they get laid off at that point and they kind of are only employed for half a year and then they aren't? And so what you do is you employ them all year round? Yeah, so we don't employ all those people all year round, but we do have a, a large number of people on, on employment throughout the year. Brazil nuts is a bit cyclical in terms of its production um, and most factories will open in March and close November, December time. So there is a period of downtime and um, some remain open the whole year. Um, but what I'm, what I'm mentioning is that at one period in 2017 when there was nothing really left to process, most factories had to shut really early. So they shut in June time or half a year. So staff had a whole six months where they were without pay, whereas we, we decided on a policy of running much slower the production um, to ensure that we stayed open later and continue to, continue to employ staff. So it, it's one of the many... It's very good of you, yeah. Yeah, well, one of the, well it was, actually, it was, it was very good of our... It was uh, thought up by our partners in Bolivia as a way of ensuring that people remained in, in, in employment. Um, and that's it, having good partners with us at Origin, which as a group actually is one of our uh, advantages. It's finding the right people who we've continued the relationships for many years um, in the right places also. Okay, now obviously um, we did briefly talk about what would be the alternatives, what else could, could be collected. Would there be a particular nut area or would it be a complete different sector that you know people would collect from? Now then, uh, well, the other alternatives would be acai and wild cacao, but really that's very small volume and, and both of those things are, are much better produced in plantations. So the alternative is wood, which, which means wood trees forest, yeah. and, exactly. uh, and after the wood then it becomes cattle. If you take a light aircraft on, across the border of, well, along the border of Bolivia, it's quite stark the difference in land you get on the Bolivian side to the Brazilian side where things are now cleared for, for cattle. Mm. And, and that, that's a historic thing which is improving also in Brazil. 
So not having Brazil nuts collected and having the alternative as being wood isn't, isn't positive. Thanks, Edward. Now, obviously, Vittori, we've got you here as well, and obviously for our listeners, he had not fallen asleep just yet. So um, let's switch uh, maybe pace and let's switch towards hazelnuts. That's your main area of expertise. Um, so why don't you give us a quick rundown of the hazelnut market at the moment? Yeah, the market had a surprise uh, with the prices firming up earlier in the mid of the largest crop uh, uh, ever, uh, which was supported with uh, the largest exports that Turkey recorded. Uh, by the time everybody understood what was happening, uh, the culprit turned out to be Italy, which is the second largest producer with their smallest crop and uh, trying to wipe out what was available in Turkey. The Turkish government also, with the pressure coming from the growers, uh, took over a fairly large quantity from the market uh, during the harvest period, which squeezed the market earlier than expected. Many users uh, had not been able to take uh, enough cover for further milk, and this is where we are at the moment. And now obviously what you've just mentioned that relates back to actual pricing. Now if we look at the, the Mintech hazelnut price from Turkey in particular, um, we've seen it's gone up you know, 22% over the last year. Um, why exactly has that happened and will it continue to happen? It's interesting actually, we had the opposite last year, we had low prices to start with at a, at a small crop and fairly high prices uh, at, a, at a big crop. Uh, currency plays a very big role on that. We had a, a fairly weak uh, Turkish lira at the beginning of the previous crop and despite a higher price in Turkish lira, it uh, supported the lower prices. This year we have a combination of a large demand and also a very strong Turkish Lira. The Turkish Lira came down in the last 12 months uh, by 25% uh, from, from its peak uh, uh, we saw in the previous year. So that's uh, part of the story. When you say demand is quite strong now, are there any particular point to, to why demand is so high at the moment, why it's picked up over the last year? Yes, one of the factors is the short Italian crop. Uh, I mean, on hazelnuts, uh, there is one large buyer that uh, I'm sure that uh, everyone knows, which produce, which is a large uh, bread producer, and all the speculation goes around them. But although they buy a good part of the Turkish crop, of course, they buy also a fairly large uh, portion of the Italian crop. But Italy also, being uh, the largest user in the world, had to divert their, need, uh, their purchases to Turkey due to their crop failures. That was one of the reasons. The second reason, was the massive growth of the Chinese market on hazelnuts. They've been changing their eating habits uh, to healthy snacks recently and hazelnut took its share. There is a conceptual product uh, called daily nuts and hazelnuts has been one of the six nuts used in the daily nuts. It's a 25 gram pack uh, where they put uh, a combination of six nuts and dried fruits in the pack claim health benefits for each of the mixtures and hazelnut is in each of these packs that takes its toll whether with one nut or two nuts uh, per pack uh, depending on the mixture so you wouldn't expect prices to necessarily drop by much over the next i don't know year or so according to what you've just said is that kind of way you see the market going supply and demand kind of saying in that same kind of balance the question at the moment is that whether they will go higher or they will stay where they are uh, but it's not that they're going to go down right so um, it's it's a, it's a bullish market. It's kind of a bullish market. What we don't know is that how large was the crop. Uh, there, are, uh, there are speculations that the crop was underestimated despite that the number circulating in the market is still the largest crop ever. Uh, the currency will play a large part in this, but with the current supply and demand the market is operating, I don't foresee a big price drop uh, despite uh, even if we see a big currency movement. What uh, can surprise us is that uh, if we have uh, a decent crop coming in the new crop and the quantity, the, the surplus that we had a factor uh, comes to the market at that point of view. One thing that the market is ignoring is that we have uh, pretty good kernel yields, which is unusual for large crops. So we may have a boost of maybe 25-30,000 ton uh, more on the overall crop, but at the moment the market is ignoring that part and focused on the uh, historical uh, biggest exports we have ever seen. 
Okay, and now obviously I know you also look at the, the vine fruit kind of sector, but before we go there, you've just mentioned like changes in eating habits and snacking habits. One of the things that we see more and more of in the, well, in the supermarkets are the dairy alternative milks, your hazelnut milks, for example. Is that already playing a part in the demand for, for nuts or is that sector still too small to really be noticed on the, on the demand side? It's still a small uh, part of the sector to be seen on the demand side because the percentage of nuts in those milk is not very high, but it's definitely a growing sector. Vittorio, very interesting. Thank you for that. Now, your other specialities, the vine fruits, obviously, sultanas, raisins. Well, what are the key demand and supply kind of impacts and what does that mean for prices? Uh, while we have a gradually growing production, uh, we don't have uh, the consumption growing at the same extent. Uh, the origins that were shying away from the most aggressive origin, which was Tur Turkey, are now getting closer in price to Turkey, uh, and in some instances they are trying to beat them to get uh, to get market share. Remembering of the markets that they had a strong hold in the 90s. Uh, with all of that, uh, we need to have uh, a price established that will boost again the consumption. On one side, we have California that is uh, saying that they, they keep pulling out packages in favor of nuts. On the other side, we've got South Africa that is replacing the, uh, the plantations that is uh, being pulled out from California. On the other side, California still uh, will remain a substantial uh, producer despite their low packages because of their more uh, productive uh, agriculture practices. So overall, uh, uh, the global uh, supply uh, will uh, continue to grow year on year, uh, while uh, the demand uh, has, uh, has to go outside of the bakery and um, uh, increase its percentage in the snack, in the snack industry. From what we see is that uh, raisin still is a historical snack uh, ingredient, but uh, it's not an ingredient uh, that, uh, that the market is talking as a hot topic. Um, well, and that's somewhat in line with obviously what our Mintec prices for raisins from the US into, into Europe are showing, which are currently coming in at $2.09 per kilogram, um, and also down 40% on the year, um, which is just quite interesting to kind of see that, that the pricing indeed follows, um, follows what you're saying there. Now, Conference season is coming up, gentlemen. Um, Biofach in Nuremberg, we've got Galford in Dubai. Um, you guys are going to be there, I'm going to be there. Do you know what people can expect when they come to the Voice Belt stands at, at both of these shows? Well, first, first of all, we hope they do come to the shows. We, we know that some people in the States are now getting a bit worried about the coronavirus. Our office in China has shut for New Year's and, and is following the guidelines to be shut for an extra week. Um, and that, that would mean they go back to work on the 10th. The question for the whole of China is who's going to back to work on the 10th? Because first of all, is it going to stay the 10th? Mm -hmm. May it be extended? And second of all, if it's not extended, how many people ignore that it's not extended and don't turn up for work anyway? And I'm not talking about the, the offices, I'm talking more about the factories where, where people have really travelled vast distances yeah. between the villages to where they actually work. So the question will be how many people do show up for work and, and, and if they don't, what's the impact on that? Um, and in terms of the trade shows, they're, they're still obviously going ahead, but there have been some conferences which have been postponed, let's yeah. say, so mm -hmm. the Cashing Up Convention in, in, in Vietnam has, has been postponed and we'll see, we'll see when that gets postponed to or if it gets relocated, or, or I'm sure. Um, so it will be great to have these trade shows where I expect all the Europeans still to travel, um, but maybe others will not. Yeah, yeah but, but you will be there, right? You are there and obviously you're... We are all there, we are there. <laughs> and, uh, Peace and uh, momentarily. No, no, we are definitely there. So our German <laughs> office have no excuse, they will always be there. But as a group, we, we're there from, from Germany, from France, from the UK, from Bolivia. Um, all in attendance, and we are also attending in strength to Gulf Foods, where we'll yeah. be there with our, our Turkish officer driving that. Mm -hmm. We could be found on the INC pavilion, um, and also 
at Expo West in Anaheim, California. Yep. Not exhibiting, but some of our partner factories who, who will be exhibiting there. It, it sounds like this is the perfect point to say uh, a thank you, but also be if you guys want to get obviously in touch with them, um, with Edward, with uh, Vittorio and uh, the rest of the Voice of our team, come and uh, join us at these shows. I will also be there. I've met all three just uh, mentioned shows. So we can talk a little bit more then if you obviously want to find out more about our pricing and intelligence that we provide from our Mintech and um, obviously do feel free to reach out to us at pricing at mintechglobal.com uh, and thank you very much from the pricing and intelligence team and thank you to you too really I appreciate it thank you for the time